Today, we get to learn about exception handling. What's up, Peloton? I'm Ryan Rigsby. Thank you for joining me on this 10-minute ride. If you're new to the Boo Crew, I need you to reach down and you're gonna see a red button on your Peloton. I need you to twist that to the right. That's gonna make it harder to pedal. I need you to twist it to the left. That's gonna make it easier to pedal. If you reach down, you're getting all hot and bothered. You reach down a little too far. Save that for later when you're watching Bridgerton. On the right hand corner of your screen, you're gonna see a leaderboard. I want you to have the courage to tap on somebody and add them as a friend. If they don't add you back, don't worry about it. Maybe there was a network error. Maybe they're just not ready to accept you into their life. Either way, we're gonna kick some butt today. So grab your water, grab a towel, fix your wig, and three, two, one, and go. Okay, let's say you're interviewing and you're asked a question about how you would handle a failed connection to a database or a web API endpoint. Well, this is where exceptions come in. Now, you've probably dealt with exceptions when you're like opening and closing files, but I want to go over some gotcha questions that you might get asked about regarding exceptions during an interview. Now, if you want to follow along at home, the code for this is down here on my GitHub or my website. Uh, if you haven't done so already, please like, please subscribe, and uh, please leave a comment down below. It all helps with the YouTube algorithm. Now, exception handling actually has a pretty long history. I think it was first created back in the 1960s uh, with the Lisp programming language. I think most of us today got introduced with it uh, when Java was introduced back in the 90s. And of course, in the 2000s, VB.net had it and C Sharp had it. But back before modern exception handling, if your code ran into an issue and the computer didn't know what to do, your program just crashed. So nowadays we can wrap potentially dangerous code inside a try catch statement. So that way if something fails, we can recover gracefully. So think of exception handling like tying a piece of twine to a method. If your program encounters an abnormal condition, you can rewind the twine and perform some action that would let the user know they need to do something different. So let's watch it in action. Okay, so I've got a unit test that's gonna populate this method, divide two numbers. In this case, I'm sending a, a numerator of two, a denominator of one, and of course, this method passes. Now, what happens if the denominator is zero? All right, so here the numerator is two, the denominator is zero, and we're gonna to try to divide by... Okay, obviously we can't divide by zero because it'll crash our program. But what if we use exception handling? Okay, so how do we implement the exception handling? Well, I'm going to try to perform this operation down here. Once I try it, if it fails, I'm going to catch the failure. This is gonna come about as an exception, in this case, exception E. I'm going to log this transaction in this fake logger, and then I'm going to display a notification to the user, just a message that says, hey, um, you can't do a divide by zero. So let's see how that works. Okay, let's run this unit test. All right, here my numerator is two, my denominator is zero. This should crash the program, but we go into try, and we try to do this operation and it fails. We catch the exception. Now, all the information about the exception is right here in the variable E. So we attempted to divide by zero. We're gonna log this and we're gonna write a, lot, write a message out to the console. We can throw a message up to the user. You get the idea. But the important thing is we didn't crash the whole program. Now, I'm just showing you this as an easy example. In a case with divide by zero, you should have already validated the customer input. So it should never get to a point where he's able to insert a zero into your program. So you shouldn't use try catch as a big failure bucket. You should never let the failure happen in the first place. But for things that involve a change in conditions that's out of your control, like writing to a file that may or may not exist or may be locked, or writing to a database that you may or may not be able to connect to, or writing to a web API endpoint that may or may not be up or down, you want to use try catch. And if something doesn't work, you might want to execute another piece of code to clean up everything. And that's where the keyword finally comes in. Okay, here we have a method that divides two numbers with handling and the finally uh, keyword. It's gonna take in a numerator, numerator and a denominator. Uh, it's gonna create a database connection. It's gonna create the answer. It's gonna push the result to the database. And uh, if it's successful, it's gonna send back an error message that says okay. And that'll go back as a tuple. If you haven't watched my video on tuples, it'll be available after this video. Uh, if something fails, it's gonna catch the exception. It's going to log a transaction, display it. It's gonna write it out. 
uh, it's going to create a, another error message that says denominator can't be zero. That way we can pass back some specific information so the user can alter what they're doing. And then finally, we're going to terminate the connection. So here's what's so neat about finally. It's always guaranteed to run. So if try runs and you don't get an exception, you can close that open database with finally. If you do get an exception and it gets caught, you can close the connection with finally. Now you might get asked this interview question. Mm, well, what if I put a return statement in the catch? Will finally still run? Well, let's find out what happens. All right, so let's enter this method here. Can you do this? Uh, the numerator is zero, the denominator is zero, so this is going to fail regardless. Uh, so we're going to try, we're going to create the connection, we're going to grab the answer. Everything blows up, so we catch and we return one, but finally runs. And we terminate the connection. If we actually take a look at what came back, we returned the caught number, one. So put a pin in this because this is one of those questions that Seymour might ask to see if he get flustered. Now he might also ask, well, can you have more than one catch statement? <laughs> there goes Seymour again, trying to trip you up. The fact is that, yeah, you can. Take a look at this uh, method right here. So here we have a method that's going to have multiple catches. Uh, in this case, we're going to create a connection. We're going to push the result of the database. If there's a divide by zero, it catches that, logs a special kind of transaction, and uh, sends back an error message of denominator can't be zero. But if there's an HTTP response exception, it does something a little bit differently. It, it still logs a transaction, but the error message that comes back will be a little bit different. Now we get an HTTP connection error. And then down here, we have a catch with exception E that's kind of like a catch-all in case there was something we didn't foresee. But does try always need a catch? No, it doesn't. You can do a try finally. So this is a try finally. In this case, we're going to create the connection and grab the answer. But if it fails, we're not actually handling that exception. We're just going straight to finally and terminating the connection. You've probably seen this before. This is basically the using statement. Um, here, you know, as long as something implements I disposable, it knows what to do when that finally rolls around. So the using statement is essentially a try finally. One more thing. Do you always need to handle an exception if you catch it? Well, you don't. I mean, you can do a try catch and just leave the catch blank, but this is a really bad practice. This is called eating an exception. I made a joke about this in my tuple video, and it's a bad idea because if you get an exception and you don't alert anybody about it or log it, then you're never going to know what actually happened. If you don't know what happened, then you can't fix the underlying condition, and that is not something you want in deployable software. Okay, to summarize, exceptions are for exceptional conditions. You can have multiple catch blocks when you have a try. You don't actually need a catch. You can do a try finally, which is very similar to the using statement. And no matter what happens, finally will always run. Good luck on your next interview. So slow down and mash that big red stop button just like JLo did with A-Rod. I need you to reach, 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 reach up for the sky and stretch and come down and have a moment of gratitude for all of the software developers who use Try Catch properly and handed all their exceptions so this Peloton network can work properly. If someone you added to your friend list didn't respond, maybe there was a network error or maybe they're just not ready to let your awesomeness into their life. Either way, let it go, Elsa. Bye, boo.